Alright, welcome to our AFF event for July of 2016. I'm Chris Spangle. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, we're going to be talking about criminal justice reform tonight. We put together a panel of Jason Pye, he is the Director of Communications for Freedom Works. And uh, Richard Samuels, who is, uh, what's your title with? You're the founder of Growing Indy. Uh, and Brett Eaton, who is a prosecuting attorney in Hancock County. And Rob Kendall will be our moderator. Rob is from Central Indiana today in Brownsburg, W. Y R Z. Y R Z. Close. So uh, you've been on the show like thirty times. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you can you can tune in on uh, what's your website? W Y R Z dot or ninety eight nine if you're in the Central Indiana area. Well, so really suck at numbers. This is this is Jason. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. All right. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Rob. Um, Basically, Rob has a, a set of questions that he's going to ask, and then we'll do a little Q&A with the Jason Crab later on. So, Rob, take it away. Yeah, so I guess my first question to you guys is, Indiana had uh, what a lot of people called some landmark changes to its criminal justice uh, system over the past couple of years. Greg Sterwald, the state rep, was one of the authors of that bill, uh, to try to put an, an onus on uh, keeping violent offenders in prison and, and trying to put more treatment programs in in place for, uh, for what are called low-level level offenders. Um, I'm just curious, nationally, if you guys feel, and, and obviously you deal with this on a local level in Hancock County, whether uh, we're putting the right amount of emphasis on keeping the right people uh, behind bars. Uh, I think as in most states, there are 32 states that have done what we call justice reinvestment initiatives. Uh, it started in Texas in 2007. Texas was facing a 500, roughly $547 billion, or $2 million dollar uh, cost for prison construction that year, and then $2 billion through 2012. And rather than build new prisons, Texas, did, uh, this, he, the uh, chairman of the Corrections Committee, Jerry Madden, was the speaker and said, this is what we're facing, $2 billion over the long term. What should we do? And the speaker said, don't build new prisons. They cost too much. And so rather than spending $547 million, million what they did was they invested about $250 million in uh, a justice reinvestment initiative, basically focusing on drug courts, putting people who have addiction problems through these drug courts where they can graduate and eventually have reentry programs where they can go out and be successful tax-paying productive citizens. Uh, and, it, and over the time it's worked, Texas has, not, Texas has averted uh, to date about $3 billion in, in uh, corrections costs. That's prison expansion, new construction costs. Uh, they have seen crime rates drop by 21%. They have the lowest crime rates they've had since 1968. Uh, that in itself defines success, and not just the cost aversion from a fiscal conservative perspective. And you also look at recidivism. Recidivism is the re-arrest rate after three years. I think in Indiana, you guys define it as the re-incarceration rate after three years, I believe. But the re-arrest rate after three years dropped by 9% from, I think, 32% uh, to 23%, which is extraordinarily low. The national average is about the national average is about uh, 38 to 40 percent. So Texas has really set the, 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 the road, uh, the path for, for justice reinvestment initiatives, and other states have taken it up. And it's predominantly Republican states like Georgia and South Carolina, uh, Utah, uh, Mississippi has even done some of this stuff. Uh, recently, Oklahoma got rid of its three strikes laws, which is uh, extraordinary. But uh, I think we, we continue to need to have a, an emphasis on diverting low-level nonviolent offenders uh, into treatment programs, into uh, re rehabilitative programming, and even people who uh, who are in prison, even violent offenders. Can anybody take a guess how many people who go into jail will eventually come out? Any guesses in the audience? Ninety-five percent. I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> Brett knows that. Brett, Brett knows this because he's heard this before. Uh, he came to a blog or something we hosted at Freedom Works uh, last month. So yeah, it's 95, 96 percent. So regardless of whether they're violent offenders or not violent offenders, we have to focus on rehabilitation. And, and uh, that includes giving them education uh, training, their work training, putting them on a path where they can be successful, and also upon reentry, uh, record sealing, expungement, ban the box, are also things that we can do. Ban the box is eliminating the criminal history box of job applications. So these guys can go back into society, become tax paying citizens, and end that cycle of crime and poverty that comes with a uh, criminal record. Well, I, you know, uh, I don't have the facts and figures. Uh, but um, I feel that uh, the, the criminal 
justice system definitely uh, it, it needs to be overhauled uh, simply because uh, I think we're putting a, an extreme burden on the, the county jail system. Uh, the county jail system is just full and overcrowded. We are sending we're sending offenders to Elkhart at $20 million a pop. You know what I mean? It's just crazy. And so we shouldn't have to spend that type of money. Um, uh, programs are great. Uh, yeah, I, I would love to see people who um, can be rehabilitated. And as I was sharing um, with uh, my prosecutor friend here earlier, um, having uh, been there uh, uh, sleeping next to some people, there are some people who just will not be rehabilitated. Um, I think that. Uh, we have to uh, concentrate on the mental health issues. Um, there are too many mental health issues that are just going unchecked. No one is uh, taking the time. When, when offenders are released, um, they're just released and that's it. You know, um, you, know you have uh, probation, you have parole, you have these uh, entities, but um, no one is talking about the issues that got them where they're in the first place. And um, until we address those issues, there's going to continue to be problems and there's going to be recidivism. Hi, my name is Brady from Prosecutor Hancock County. Um, I've worked in the justice system as a uh, prosecutor. Let's see, I started in 2002. I was a prosecutor in 2002, 3, 4, 5, 6. I then went as a defense attorney from 2006 to 2014. And I've now been a prosecutor from 2015 to 2016. So I've been a prosecutor in Hancock County, Indiana. Um, for those of you that may not be familiar, Hancock County, Indiana is directly east of here. We have a population of about 70,000 people. And you know what, with the criminal justice reform, what's functionally happened is the people that used to go to DOC now go to the local jail. So the pool of people for limited bed spaces has increased dramatically. And so as a result of that, facilities that were built to house 150 people or 160 people or under 70 people may have to hold 200 or 210 or 220. And there's not been, at this point, the funding. Ultimately, you've got a large appeal pool of people to draw from. And the problem really becomes when you convict somebody of something, maybe you get a suspended sentence and you get them to try to go to rehabilitation and treatment. And you know what? If 90% of those people do those things, that leaves 10% that doesn't. And then you get into an issue of, okay, We'll, we'll try this and we'll try this, but ultimately there is going to be a certain percentage of people that is always is going to fail. And you get to a point where you're going to have to have some type of consequence. And when currently in Indiana, I think most of our donor counties and most of the counties in Indiana are having this problem where we have a much larger pool of people that are eligible for the limited number of beds we have, and we have we don't have any more beds. And so I mean Ultimately, criminal justice is largely a local problem. People elect a prosecutor, people elect a sheriff, people elect judges. If they like and support the vision of those people who love have in the justice system, they can re-elect them. If they don't like them, they can get rid of them and get a new person. And so, in a lot of ways, you know, the national solutions are nice, but ultimately it's largely a local issue where people can, you know, support or not support whom they wish because they are local issues. Um, Ultimately, most people do get out. I think most prosecutors, if, if they knew, they would support things that will make it less likely for people when they get out to reoffend. Every rational person will look at it and say, boy, you know, if I have to go to trial and I have to win this trial, and I know when I'm done, and he will, you know, the guy will go into his time and be out and never come back, well, that's a win. That's what every reasonable prosecutor is going to want. The thing is, is that there's no magic wand. We can't know that. And there's some people that we can have a lot of opportunities do a lot of things to try to help people, and some people don't. No matter what happens, they will be there. Yeah. And, and the danger there is because all these offices are elected. If you're the problem, okay, every day I'm heavily involved with our work program in Hancock County. And so one of the things we try to do is take people that are, you know, arrested with a syringe or arrested with heavy narcotic, like heroin or methamphetamine. And there's a portion of the program where, you know, they will have some incarceration balance with some treatment balance with some therapy and a series of other things so that we can try to take somebody that's a net consumer of government resources and try to help them become somebody that's able to stand on their own two feet and be a productive member of society. Going back about 10 years, I want to say we've got a 60 or 70 percent success rate that if they make it, then they're not arrested in the five. And so we feel pretty good about what we're doing. 
the danger there is, is if you take somebody and you take a risk on somebody, and then they go out and they commit my robbery, well then we will them more. And so there's a fair, and it is all local, so there's a fair amount of, of risk that comes with, ultimately on the question you asked, is currently, I think in most donut counties, there's a lot more potential offenders for bets than there are bets, and that's a substantial problem. Uh, at the same time, though, you know, it does provide us the opportunity for creative solutions to those questions. Uh, just, sure. just make a quick point. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so before I, before I came up here, this is actually my first time in Indiana. And speaking on this topic, uh, I studied a, a bunch of different states as the primary person at Freedom Works U.S. Criminal Justice Reform. Uh, but I, I call up a friend of mine who used to work for Ride on Crime. Uh, they're a project of the Texas Public Policy Foundation. And we were talking about Indiana, and uh, she said that the JRI program, or at least the commission that was set up, was set up under Mitch Daniels back in 2012. Interest, interestingly, uh, Indiana did things a little bit differently than other states. A lot of other states, they increased penalties for violent offenders, like Texas and Georgia. They increased penalties for violent offenders, but they balanced it out with uh, lowering penalties for nonviolent offenses for low-level uh, offenders. And getting, they either get rid of some felonies or reduce some misdemeanors or what have you. Interestingly, Indiana didn't balance it out enough. And they also didn't provide enough funding for local jails. So Indiana uh, has done things not necessarily the wrong way, they just have an accomplished goal. Uh, and they need to go back and they need to, the legislature needs to come back and start accomplishing the goal and fixing the problems that were left by those initial reforms. Another thing I would point out uh, related to crime. Um, so how many of you guys watched uh, the, uh, the RNT uh, Trump's ex uh, acceptance speech? Did anybody watch it? Curiosity. I was on. A, that's fair. Uh, I was on an airplane. Uh, thank God. But I did read it, and I got an email from Reason Magazine the next day, and they're like, "So, what did you think of Trump's speech related to crime rates?" Uh, so, how many of you would be surprised if I told you crime has actually been falling for the last thirty years? Is any? Yeah. So that's the one thing that kind of like left me perplexed listening to this very ominous picture of what America is right now, where crime is is rising dramatically and. And it's, it's simply, 2015 may be an anomaly, but over the bigger picture, it's simply not true. Violent crime, gun-related crime, is uh, gun homicides, excuse me, are down by 49% since uh, 1993. This is Pew Research who says this. Uh, see, generally, general violent crime is down by 75% since 1993. Um, and again, this is Pew Research. Uh, the FBI has also, uh, also confirmed that. Uh, so we're seeing drops in violent crime. Even if the crime rate did go up in 2015, it doesn't mean it's a, a trend. A one year does not a trend make. And during the, the drop in violent crime from 1993 to 2013 or 2014, there were even a couple years in a row where we saw increases in homicides, 2005 and 2006. Guess what happened in 2007? Homicides started falling again, and they've been falling ever since. So just put, want to put things in context, and then you talk about um, uh, it's the person who gets released and he subsequently reoffends and maybe possibly a much more serious crime. Something I'm dealing with at the national level, thanks to David Perdue, Tom Cotton, and a bunch of other horrible senators. Um, <laughs> I didn't say that out loud. Let, let me ask this as a follow-up question. One of the one of the uh, biggest issues or grievances with the criminal justice system is all the perceived lack of consistency. And I'd be curious to start with our, our prosecutor here. Um, is there a lack of consistency? How hard is it? to make sure that each person is sentenced at least fairly in a fairly similar manner for a crime. Well, uh, oh, he's going to take it first. All right, <laughs> give me that damn thing. Um, so there are two instances of people I can give you that were sentenced far above what they should have been sentenced. Uh, uh, so Sharonda Jones. Sharonda Jones was a low-level player in a drug ring based somewhere in Texas. I want to say Houston, but I don't remember. She was recently commuted. Her, her sentence was commuted by the president. Um, she was given sentencing enhancements for having a concealed carry license. She didn't have a weapon on her when she was arrested. She had a concealed carry license. Her prison term was life. Life. She was a non-violent offender. She was given a sentencing enhancement for having a license. Another one is Weldon Angelos. I know Brett and Chloe have heard about Weldon Angelos. Has anybody else heard this story? Uh, there's a really great uh, video by Gen Op, uh, Generation Opportunity about Weldon Angelos and his family. Weldon Angelos was given 55 years for selling $1,000 worth of marijuana. The reason he was given 55 years is because he actually had a gun on him uh, the first time. He didn't brandish it. He didn't. He didn't fire it. Nothing like that. It was. Uh, it's a. It's a code under federal law 924C that he was prosecuted under. 
Uh, so, but under 924C, the sentences are stacked. You get five years for the first offense, 25 years for each additional offense. So he was a first time offender, one single indictment, indictment, three counts, five for the first one, 25 for the second one, and 25 for the third one. He was sent to jail for 55 years. Thankfully, and we don't know how this happened yet because we know he wasn't commuted, but he was released from jail after about 12 to 15 years. And he's back now, he's out advocating for sentencing reform at the federal level. So those are two people I can give you examples, real life examples of people who were over sentenced, who, who definitely maybe should have deserved jail, jail time. I don't disagree with that. But life in 55 years for what were essentially nonviolent offenses, and yes, if you don't brandish or fire, fire a gun during something like that, I don't think you're a violent offender. Uh, I think it's just categorized as an example of one, one size fits all sentencing. But those are two real life examples of over sentencing. We need to fix this. I and mean, this is federal stuff. This is not local stuff. This is federal issues. But we, we have to start addressing this. And we need to go after the people who are blocking uh, federal sentencing reform, like Tom Cotton, David Perdue, and a few others. Question which is about consistency in sentencing, and, and there's a perception, I think a lot of what the Black Lives Matters movement is, is a perceived lack of consistency in sentencing, started a national conversation. I'd be curious to get your opinion on whether there is consistency in sentencing, and, and if not, why there might be some discrepancies. Well, any system run by people is inherently going to be flawed. And so, you know, every day prosecutors around the country go to court thousands of times. And prosecutors around the country do remarkable work for victims around the country every single day. And hundreds of thousands of cases are adjudicated on an annual basis. And so the vast, vast majority of prosecutors are hardworking, decent, honest people that put forth an incredible amount of effort to seek justice for victims. And when somebody is harmed, or when somebody is injured or when their spouse is taken away from them or their loved ones taken away from them, prosecutors are that voice to bring justice for them. And so, you know, if you're going to pour through an amount of data that's almost unlimited, I am certain in any given situation, it could be teachers or any people of religious faith, you can find one or two people. The prosecutors ultimately have an awesome amount of power. It is the power to bring charges, the power to bring cases to trial. And that power really is an incredibly awesome responsibility. And prosecutors have a, a real responsibility to exercise it judiciously and to exercise it with justice in their heart to try to seek out what is truly the right thing for the, the people that they're trying to serve. That said, you know, if because the system allows prosecutors to have the authority that we do, given the number of prosecutors around the country, there it's, it's possible that there could be a time when somebody would make the bad That's possible. But when I, when I look at the prosecutors around the country and the work that they do on a day-by-day -day basis, I'm incredibly proud of all that information. When, uh, when Chris introduced me, uh, what he failed to say is uh, I spent 26 years of my life in the criminal justice system. Uh, and uh, so I'm from the inside of it. Uh, Uh, consistency as far as sentencing, uh, you're really not going to have consistency because of the fact that uh, a lot of times uh, it depends on whether you have a personal lawyer or a public defender. Um, it, it has a lot to do sometimes. with... Uh, sometimes. Sometimes. Uh, it has a lot to do with... This is true. You're absolutely right. Some public defenders do great work. However, um, I don't think that it, it would be the choice of everyone who um, is not Caucasian to have a public defender. Um, I think that nationality, I think that uh, uh, ethnicity plays a large part. Uh, when we get into the criminal justice system, um, you're talking about consistency as far as sentencing. Uh, when you look at um, the types of time that people are given for uh, $10 worth of crack cocaine, and this is the reason why we're even talking about this, is because um, you had people flying tons of cocaine over here that are getting probation, and you got guys out here on the streets that are selling $20 bags that are getting 20 years. And this is the reason why things are changing now, because it, it, it 
has come to everyone's attention that this is ludicrous. It doesn't make sense. And uh, so, you know, um, from, the, from, from the perspective of someone who um, understands it from the inside of it, um, there's not going to be a level playing field until a whole lot of barriers and a whole lot of uh, attitudes are adjusted and they come down. Um, we, you know, we can talk statistics, we can talk all of this, but, you know, real lives are being affected. You know, um, this is not just, uh, oh, you know, we talk about this and we go home. You know, we got people who um, are incarcerated and, you know, the problem is that we don't talk about the families that are left behind those incarcerated. You know, um, my wife here uh, has, has spent uh, 23 years waiting for me. You know what I mean? And, and not only that, she pays her taxes. She does everything that she's supposed to do right. And she's having to having expenditures of JPay, uh, all of the privatizations that the Clinton administration brought into mandatory sentencing. You know, everybody's saying hooray for Hillary, but you know, trust and believe, I, I have a problem with that because I understand what Bill Clinton uh, brought to us. Absolutely. And so um, I just think that, um, you know, uh, we have to truly uh, get a handle and, and understand, uh, and yeah, go right there. <laughs> Public defenders, though, it's the same thing. As I deal with lawyers every day, I dealt with lawyers all day. I was in court this afternoon, and uh, you know, before I'm in court, the lawyers come to me and hey, well, what, what are we going to do on this? What's the offer on that? Are we going to have a trial? Are you willing to bend or not? Well, no, Jeff, we're going to go to trial. Whatever it's going to be, but they don't come to me and say, hey, this is my private client, so give me a better deal on this. These are my public defender clients, and so you know, whatever. No, that's not. I've not had one case that I can recall where the lawyer that, you know, most of the time the lawyers are in the local community, most of the time they're people you practice with, most of the time they're people you see in the social circles or in town, and, you know, they'll have cases, in some cases have to get tried, in some cases can be resolved. But it's not something where it's perceptible from the perspective I have that, you know, Jeff or Cody will say, hey, these are my public defender cases in this guy. <coughs> And these are my private pay cases in this state. Oh, because I'm getting, you know, because I'm a public defender here, well then I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do this deposition. I mean, that's just, every person is different. And every public defender, every public defender system in every community is different. How they fund things, or how they're going to determine funding, or what resources they're going to give, or if they're going to allow the public defender to take those depositions, or do that discovery. And so I can't speak for the kind of because I don't know every community. But generally speaking, you know, that's, from the prosecutor's perspective, that's what happens. As the lawyers come to us and they, maybe they want to have a trauma, but they don't. It's not as if it's so transparent as it is in case. That's not to say it's impossible for it to happen. I don't know. I don't know every single person that's there. I don't. But from the perspective that where we are, that's just not how it happens. I know that from, in my own personal background, I had a period of time where I did do some public defender work. And you've got a client, and you lose some of and you do your best. Sometimes you get in trouble because you've got a caseload where things become very difficult, but that becomes an issue of how they fund that. And so, you know, it's it's anytime you have human beings, you're gonna have errors. And anytime you're gonna have human error. But you know, I think that that's inherent within any system that has people operating. And when you have human beings and you have errors, uh, errors are those that land people in prison um, on the death penalty. And they're innocent. Uh, that's a scary uh, possibility. Uh, but as far as the uh, the public defenders are concerned, uh, and I think that you, you really uh, hit it with the last part of what you were saying, uh, their caseloads are so heavy that it's almost to the point where uh, plea bargaining is the first thing out of their mouth. You know, they're trying to uh, dispose of their cases. Um, and, and, and I understand that, you know, of course, they're going to ask uh, certain questions and um, they're going to do certain, their due diligence, but for the most part, uh, if you look at the majority of cases, um, they're plea bargained out and, and people, and the people who are their plea bargained to really don't even understand what it is that's happening to them until they're incarcerated. And then they look back and say, wow, that, and I worked for five years in the law library. Uh, and, and I've, you know, countless guys coming back to me saying, well, 
I didn't know this, and, and the, the public defender never told me this, and is this what they could do? They, they had no idea what was happening until it was like, well, there's a sign right here on the plea bargain, and their main thing is to try to get as less time as possible. And then, of course, you know, the, the, the advent of the habitual criminal. You know, there, there are certain things that they threaten you with on a regular basis. I don't care uh, if you, especially if you're a repeat offender, uh, you go in, in, in front of any kind of judge, if you're a repeat offender, um, just like if you're looking at television and, and they say somebody did this, the first thing that they're going to plaster across the screen is all of the things that he did 20 years ago. You know, and they want to make it look as ugly as possible so that it's justified in whatever conclusion that they come to. I'm not saying that some public defenders are not um, are good at what they do. I'm not saying that um, they're um, inadequate in any way. What I am saying is that their caseloads are so heavy that most of the time they don't have the time to put the due diligence in. We don't have a dream team. You know, I'm not going to get a dream team. You know what I mean? I'm not I'm just not, you know, I'm not going to get the type of defense that I deserve because, and that every single individual deserves. Uh, and so, that's all. Uh, so, two things real fast. Um, so, plea deals are actually, you said majority, it's actually much more than that. It's a vast majority. Uh, in, in some states, it's as high as 90%, if not over 90%. Uh, that's how many cases are pled out. Uh, that in and of itself is concerning, and the reason a lot of those cases are pled out is because many people, especially people who are poor from from uh, underrepresented communities, uh, can't afford attorneys. They, they go with uh, they go with uh, uh, indigent defense. Uh, but the prosecutors, and no offense, you understand you're doing your job. The prosecutors hang over their heads these late mandatory minimum sentences. You look at the mandatory minimum for crack cocaine. It used to be a hundred to one disparity for crack cocaine. Now it's eighteen to one thanks to the Fair Sentencing Act of two thousand ten. At the federal level, it's been reduced, but it's still a disparity. But you hang over someone's head for selling a few grams of uh, crack cocaine, a five-year mandatory minimum sentence is they're they're going to plead down. No. They're going to plead out and take the, they're going to plead guilty and they're going to go to jail either time less than a mandatory minimum sentence. Um, there was a the, one of the first com uh, the first commissioners or chairman of the U.S. Sentencing Commission noted that it's often the low-level players who get the, man the lengthy mandatory minimum sentences, not the drug kingpins. That's concerning. Uh, and this guy was appointed by Ronald Reagan in the 80s when the U.S. Sentencing Commission was uh, founded. And another thing that I want to note real fast and as an aside, because I recently at FreedomWorks on our Facebook uh, uh, page, uh, facebook.com slash FreedomWorks, I had the opportunity to interview uh, two uh, U.S. attorneys, former U.S. attorneys, uh, Matt Orwig and um, uh, Brett Tolman. And uh, just one, Brett Tolman was appointed by Bush. He was served in Utah. Orway served in Texas. He was also appointed by Bush. And um, just, it, the, the, the idea, the notion that uh, it's not just human error, and, and I, or, or we're, it's not just that our, our justice system is crafted by humans and, and we have prosecutors who are human. We have guys who go after people uh, and they constantly go after people simply because if they don't spend the money they have in their budget, they're not going to be able to get that increase they want next year. And I'm not saying that's widespread. Um, there are a few bad apples in the bunch, and I'm not trying to, to carte blanche say this is the problem with the entire system. But these guys, they justify their budgets based on the number of cases they get and the number of people they prosecute. This is what happens when you have 5,000 federal criminal statutes and up to 400,000 regulations that carry criminal penalties. That is our federal criminal justice system. We have an overcriminalization problem. Sitting problem, and, and the, the, the justice system, in my opinion, we need a complete recodification of what our federal criminal system uh, is, and then also to go through and just completely smash the regulatory state and eventually start rebuilding it up to the point where it's not criminalizing everybody. There is not one person in this room who hasn't committed a federal crime, myself included. Did you has it, have you anybody has anybody shared their Netflix password with someone? You committed a federal crime. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is how widespread this is the problem is. Uh, so, congratulations, you're all criminals. Well, let's go to victim, victimless crimes. We're going to go victimless crimes, drugs, prostitution, things like that. Um, we have certain states now that are just blatantly ignoring federal law, and I would be curious how we start to deal. Uh, with victimless crimes, do we see? Are we seeing a change in this? And I'd be curious to start here from a prosecutorial perspective. Is there such a thing as a victimless crime? Well, I want to jump back just a second. 
is when criminal code change in Indiana, we don't have nearly as many mandatory minimums as we used to. And so pretty much most everything you're going to see is pretty much suspendable. And so that's a different animal than what it was before the change. Speaking more and, it, and I guess to be clear for people here, you know, there's the federal system, the federal system is run by the federal government. And then your system that most people in the vast majority of criminal cases are involved in the state system. The state system that is going to be devolved down into your county with your county prosecutors and judges. And in the state of Indiana, you know, you're okay, murder, you've got a minimum, you've got a minimum on that. But most things, and this is really probably the most dramatic change that occurred, is that most everything now is suspendable. And so that's just not the reality of the day-to-day -day of what we have now. Um, I, I disagree um, because sure. if you're talking the about stuff, first time offenders, the stuff that we deal with. If you're talking on a first time offenders, basis. but if you've got a criminal history, then you're not suspended. Automatically, you're not going to get anything suspended if you've got a previous crime. I mean, it just doesn't happen. Yeah, All right, let's, let's go on to victimless crimes. I mean, here's your <laughs> thoughts. Is there such a thing as a victimless crime? And is the sentencing and, and prosecution of that, is that, a, is that a fair thing? And, and uh, where are we at with that? The priority for the bad justice and should be for those crimes and for those people that cause direct harm to other people. The people that cause physical harm are the ones we should try to put in there first. The ones that may cause you know, property damage crime are the ones we should probably try to put in there second. The ones, you know, if I come over to your house and I break all of your stuff, well, you know, I probably should be in jail. If I come over to your house, I break all your stuff and I beat the crap out of you, I probably should be in jail, right? Now, if I, at the same time, we have, we have a pretty big opiate heroin problem in most communities in Central Indiana. And we know when someone shows up and there's a syringe and you look at their history and you can tell what's going on and somebody's been arrested and you can just, you, you know that they probably used heroin in the previous 40 hours. And if we turn around and let them out on a very low bond right away, you very well may be sending them off to die. Because they will get out and they will use. And there's a, we've had a, more than a few people that have had that and they don't come back to the next hearing because they overdosed them. And so initially there may be a reason to have a higher bond on those people. And then you may be able to do something to help get them in treatment or help, to help them recover. Potentially you can. But initially when they come in, are you okay? You look at it. I understand. I understand the call of this crime. But if you're a prosecutor and you look at that and you see that person, you know, I think there's a really good chance that it's a substance use problem. Sure, I'll agree to release her under cognizance. And then Miss Smith doesn't come back because she overdosed and she died. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then have you done your job? I don't think you have. And so, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of very difficult issues when you deal with substance abuse. And so, you know, I don't think that there's a one size fits all solution, but I certainly do think that with methamphetamine and with heroin, that treatment and helping those people to become useful, productive members of society should be part of the equation and what we attempt to do. Uh, hmm. So. Heroin has been around for how long? Okay. So, so all of a sudden, we are in the needle sharing program. We've got programs for, you know, where people can go and get help and, and all of this. This is not new. So why didn't we have these programs before when all of the blacks were dying? All of a sudden, we've come up with all of these alternatives, okay? But my thing is, this is not new. This has been going on for decades and decades and decades. But all of a sudden, now that it has affected the white population, all of a sudden now, it becomes we have to have a needle sharing program. We have to have 
have this, we have to have that. Hmm. Something to think about. I wonder where all of that was when everybody else was doing the exact same thing. Okay. Uh, heroin has been here. Her heroin is not, not new. Crack cocaine is not new. This stuff is not new. All of a sudden, these programs are popping up. Okay. Well, what At the age of 76, she had a dog tied up in her yard. Okay, it wasn't even a dog. It was it was my sister's dog, her daughter. My sister moved away. The dog was there. We fed it. You know, make sure the dog eats. No problem. Got the chain on. Well, the dog had pulled at its collar for a long time. The neighbors that moved in decided, oh, this is animal cruelty because the dog has the blood on his collar. Do you know that they called animal control? They came, they locked her mother up, they gave her a number, and they had her on probation. And she had to go and do piss tests on a regular basis. And it's because she 